Chapter 12, Far Out Vanu Strategies. Obviously, the entire purpose of this book is to give you, the reader, practical strategies to increase your personal freedom. That said, there are a couple of H-level MTH options Rayo proposed that are unlikely to come to fruition in our lifetime. Sovereign free ports, a libertarian country, seasteads, and space steads. Along with these distant possibilities comes a colored history of libertarianism that most ideological adherents are not familiar with. In August of 2017, I wrote up that history for Ocean Loving Magazine, the magazine of the Mariana Project, now defunct, which I was the communication specialist for. Seasteading case studies, learning from the failed attempts of the past. Chapter for thousands of years, land has provided human beings the optimal headquarters for living. Resources were aplenty. Large amounts of real estate were available for homesteading, and individuals could develop as they saw fit. Bonus that is, until two important things happened. One, the advent of urbanization, or the corralling of large amounts of people into small areas. And two, various governments' jurisdictional claims to 99.9% .9 of all land in the world, including the most obscure uninhabited islands. A large number of folks' subjective preferences led them to remain in the cities. But there are those seeking a return to the land in the form of off-grid homesteading. They just want to be left alone with nature. But governments, tending to be the control freaks that they are, have a nasty habit of fining and evicting private property owners via nuisance abatement, i.e. local codes and ordinances. As Tom Marshall, Rayo, a freedom pioneer in the 1960s and 70s said, Apply your free market principles by setting sail for sunnier waters. And he was right. The homesteading of the sea, seasteading, will play and is playing an inevitable role in the future of human freedom and survival. Mariana is but one such project looking to found a village at sea. The other one with any notoriety would be the Seasteading Institute. Little known, there were also a few attempts at founding new libertarian countries in the open ocean in the mid 20th century. For purposes of historical relevance as well as potential lessons for current and future seasteaders, let's take a look at their failed efforts to see where they went wrong. Authors note, due to the scarcity of resources at the time this article goes to press, specific years may not always be provided. The resources referenced are the Nation Builders Struggle, Brian Doherty's Radicals for Capitalism, Rayo's Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, Roy Holiday's Operation Atlantis, Erwin Strauss' How to Start Your Own Country, and some updates to the projects from Wikipedia. The Free Isles Project. The Free Isles Project was a venture that spawned out of the Preform Inform movement and the innovator libertarian zine in the 1960s. The goal was to conduct research on the efficacy of setting up a new libertarian country, solutions to potential obstacles, and the seemingly endless possibilities if it were to come to fruition. This project continued for a handful of years, but it never got past the talking stage. Eventually, the movement subsided after disagreements arose regarding the size and scope of government, the lack of individuals willing to become involved, and the potential ramifications from existing nation-states. Nonetheless, the Free Isles Project seemed to be the origin of these ventures and influenced at least one, if not all, of the projects below. Operation Atlantis From the outset, the Free Isles Project was just a research effort. The first actual attempt at bringing a new libertarian nation into fruition was Werner Stiefel's Operation Atlantis. The plan was laid out in three stages. 1. Gather libertarians in a single location. 2. Acquire an ocean vessel and declare it to be an independent nation while in international waters. And 3. Create an artificial island as close to the shores of the U.S. as international law will permit and Uncle Sam will tolerate. Furthermore, according to Brian Doherty in his book Radicals for Capitalism, their goal was to eventually obtain sovereignty over some island and turn it into a fresh new country. From there, they would have their base of operations and would start to build artificial platforms, which would hopefully coalesce into the actual objective, a floating nation on the water. The location he chose for recruiting libertarians was a hotel he had purchased in Saugertine, New York, which is right on the Hudson River, giving them water access to the Atlantic Ocean. From scratch, they constructed a boat out of rebar and cement and set sail, only to have their vessel tip over and catch fire in the Hudson River. Persevering, they were able to navigate the vessels to the Silver Shoals area, near the Bahamas, where their ship sank. Luckily, Stifle had already negotiated a 220-year lease for some land on the Haitian island Tortuga. 
with the agreed-upon reason being for a small commercial chemical mixing plant. But once the Haitians learned of their plan to start a floating nation from their own publication, President Jean-Claude Duvalier drove them out of their area, as it had already been slated for other purposes. It is reported by Erwin Strauss, author of How to Start Your Own Country and Visitor to the Hotel, that Mr. Stifel was approaching the enterprise as a Sunday afternoon diversion, while focusing most of his time and efforts on his pharmaceutical company. Strauss attributes that to one of the main reasons the dream of Atlantis died. Michael Oliver's The Capitalist Country Michael Oliver was a Lithuanian-born concentration camp survivor who set out to found The Capitalist Country in 1968. He investigated many areas for his new nation and attempted to solidify purchases of land from countries with little government, but it was to no avail until Minerva was founded in 1972. Oliver and his crew laid claim to two small coral atolls in the southern Pacific, 400 miles south of Fiji and 260 miles northeast of the Kingdom of Tonga. Notices were sent to nations that they began dredging, capping out at 15 acres before running out of investment capital, far below their goal of 2,500 acres. Doherty reports that the project was breaking apart over personal squabbling and that Oliver was washing his hands of the whole thing. Surrounding island countries caught wind of the venture and understood the negative ramifications if it were allowed to succeed. Then, on February 23, 1972, a box of supplies was dropped labeled Supplied and Maintained by the Government of Tonga. The actions by the Tongan government were supported by many surrounding island countries. And in the blink of an eye, and with one gun vote, Minerva was conquered by the King of Tonga. After that, Oliver pursued other strategies in founding his nation, until he finally returned to the original goal, building artificial ocean cities. In the early 1990s, he set out to found the country of Oceania, and penned the venture as the already known and nostalgic Atlantis Project. In less than a couple of years, it ended, and at Oceania.org, it still reads, The Atlantis Project which proposed the creation of a floating sea city named Oceania, began in February of 1993, receiving nationwide publicity from the Art Bell Show, Details Magazine, the Miami Herald, Boating Magazine, and worldwide publicity in Canada, New Zealand, Hong Kong, England, and Belgium. The project ended in April of 1994. Sea City, Taluga. In 1969, the Cortez Development Corporation set out to found Sea City, Taluga, a project focused primarily on tourism and recreation rather than libertarian ideals like the previous case studies. Nonetheless, they still planned on setting up an autonomous government, albeit structured more like a corporation's board of trustees than a traditional one. The location chosen was Chortez Bank, an area allegedly claimed by no government 100 miles west of Mexico. In the most complete article written on the subject of new libertarian nations, John I. Snare claims that the bank rises from the deep ocean floor and is not on the continental shelf by any accepted geological or legal definition. Phase 1 was estimated to cost $350 million, keep in mind the year, and the entire project a substantial $2 billion. It was a major undertaking. But unfortunately, sometime after 1972, the U.S. government declared that the bank, as part of the continental shelf, was U.S. territory. The plan died and all capital investment in the project was wasted. What can we learn? Let's first revisit why these projects failed or came to an end. The Free Isles Project. It was purely a research venture, and the participants deemed it to be an inefficacious pursuit. Operation Atlantis. It seems they weren't completely honest in their contractual agreements with Duvalier, and therefore he drove them out of the area when they started work on the floating nation. Operation Minerva. Their fate was sealed by infighting, a lack of funding, and an embarrassing lack of defense. Oceania, Operation Atlantis II, it was simply a lack of funding and interest. Sea City Taluga? The U.S. caught wind of the project and declared the continental shelf U.S. territory. Two terms need to be defined to make sense of this. Contiguous zone, CZ, a band of water extending from the outer edge of the territorial sea up to 24 nautical miles from the baseline within which a state can exert limited control for the purposes of preventing or punishing infringements of its customs, fiscal, immigration, or sanitary laws and regulations. Exclusive Economic Zone, EEZ, extends from the outer limits of the territorial sea to a maximum of 200 nautical miles from the territorial sea baseline. A coastal nation has control of all economic resources within its exclusive economic zone. 
However, it cannot prohibit passage or loitering above, on, or under the surface of the sea. The demise of Operation Atlantis can easily be attributed to the fact that they were within the CZ of Haiti and that their contractual agreement, as far as we know, did not include their plans for starting a nation at sea. Operation Minerva, the capitalist country, provides us with a more sinister outcome. They were well outside the EEZ of Fiji and were about 30 miles outside of the EEZ of Tonga. Yet, the Tongan government still brought forth aggressive action to evict Oliver and his associates, much to the satisfaction of the surrounding island nations. Erwin Strauss attributes their downfall to the lack of ability to defend their land. Yet he postulates that Tonga could have easily obtained military support from the larger nations if it was necessary. To paraphrase Psalms, put not your trust in princes, nor should you place faith in governments to actually follow their own laws. Moreover, C-City Taluga provides us with an example of what not to do. Utilize any continental shelf, lagoon, atoll, etc. that is within the EEZ of the United States. Even though Snare claimed that there is no legal or geological justification for ownership, the U.S. still swooped in and crashed the party. It's not wise to put that much investment capital at risk when the government can change terms and definitions willy-nilly. How Mariné plans to avoid these issues. The KSAL Bank is well outside any nation or country's CZ, and Mariné will not be infringing upon any nation or country's EEZ, since it will be a floating village at sea. Also, the success of Mariné will not depend or rely on some contractual agreement with the government of the Bahamas nor of any other country. There will be neighborly cooperation, if applicable, but that's about it. Furthermore, the three-phase plan is realistic and doesn't require hundreds of millions of dollars of investing to get off the ground. The first phase of the project specifically will be a ship under flag of convenience by way of a modified shipping barge. The efficacy of this strategy has been proven time and time again. Summarily, one of the issues that continually came up with the aforementioned case studies, as well as other new nation projects, is the lack of or running out of funding. Marinet has an answer to this problem. Once phase one is achieved, there will be extensive money-making possibilities which will reduce, if not eliminate, the need for outside investing. As George Santayana is attributed to have said, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Current and future seasteaders would be wise to learn from the mistakes of their predecessors and correct them to increase their chances of success. In the long view of human history, this is still a brand new strategy, and I envision many more unforeseen obstacles before the inevitable success. Seasteaders are the pioneers of the modern era. Rather than utilizing the failed political means, they are the folks seeking to shift the entire paradigm and open the world up to a whole new slew of possible solutions to problems that humans face going into the future. So, as you can see, there were quite a few attempts by libertarians to set up free countries, sovereign freeports, and other seastead ventures, but for one reason or another, they all failed. They are worth discussing, though, because if any of these were to be successful, the game would change you can probably think of a few advantages of such strategies. But here's what Rayo has to offer. The most ambitious scheme for a local area of freedom so far proposed, a sovereign free port, would potentially have much to offer. The Free Isle resident would, hypothetically, have all of the advantages of participating in a world commerce while being free from taxes and regulations. Furthermore, a Free Isle, if it were successful, could be a very effective demonstration of the merits a laissez-faire capitalism. There are different variations of the above strategies. Let's examine those briefly. Libertarian countries could hypothetically be founded on uninhabited ocean islands, seasteads, or on land purchased from existing governments. Sovereign freeports could hypothetically be created on decommissioned aircraft carriers or otherwise large boats, underwater in a large submarine, why not, or on land leased or purchased from an existing government. Think Hong Kong. Seasteads could hypothetically be founded in international waters like Marine, outside the purview of any government, or in the jurisdiction of another country like the Seasteading Institute is pursuing with French Polynesia. Obviously, not all approaches are created equal, and I prefer the strategy in which there's no subjugation to governments. Hell, from looking at the history, it's clear that they can't be trusted to keep their agreements nor can they be relied upon to mind their own damn business and leave us peaceful people alone.
but we, as Vanuans, already knew that. Fortunately, it appears some of the focus is shifting away from the political crusading, and there are modern attempts to bring many of these strategies into fruition. I mentioned the Seasteading Institute and the Marina Project, unfortunately now defunct due to a lack of funding and interest, a moment ago. But the newest attempt is by the Free Society Foundation. They are looking to purchase land from an existing government to be used as a new libertarian country. I wrote an article on the latter previously. Roger Ver, Free Society Foundation plan to found new libertarian country. Authors note, surprisingly, I have found Roger's presentation at the Nexus Conference. He clarifies a couple of points of concern that I address in the article. I will notate which portions in brackets below the original statement. Nonetheless, Erwin S. Strauss's concerns are still valid. Many strategies have been pursued by libertarians and anarchists over time to increase personal freedom and minimize the influence of states. One such strategy is the founding of a new libertarian country, wherein private property is respected and the efficacy of the free market can be proven once and for all. The first such attempt that I have been able to come across was Preform Inform, a group of Southern California freedom seekers in the 1960s who investigated the prospects of founding a new libertarian country on a floating artificial platform or on an uninhabited ocean island somewhere. After a handful of years, the members gave up, citing the many, to them, unsolvable obstacles. Other such projects included Operation Atlantis, Mike Oliver's The Capitalist Country, Sea City Taluga, the DuPont Caribbean Freeport Resort, and Oceania, all of which failed. Roger Ver and the folk at the Free Society Foundation plan to do something similar and have allegedly already raised $100 million. They claim that the solution to really gain sovereignty is to negotiate with an existing government by outright buying a piece of land from them. Their criteria for a location are proximity to existing economic powerhouses, accessibility by water, located in a safe, conflict-free area, stable existing government, nations with a significant national debt, a flexible constitution that allows granting sovereignty, and acceptable minimum size for the land. As expected, the rule of law will be based on libertarian principles and free markets. That all seemed well and good, except for the fact that this has been tried before, and to no avail. For example, Werner Stiefel, the founder of Operation Atlantis, negotiated a 220-year lease for land on the Haitian island Tortuga. And not long after they settled, President Jean-Claude Duvalier expropriated the project once he discovered their plans. Similarly, DuPont Caribbean Incorporated of Texas made an agreement with the Haitian government to build a free port resort on the same island, and Duvalier, again, expropriated the project, this time in favor of the Gulf Oil Corporation. Not to mention that their founders, or in some cases CEOs, all sourced the earth in search of a government that would sell them a piece of land, and they had to settle on leases. Erwin S. Strauss, the authority, on new country projects in the 20th century offers some valuable insights into the potentiality for a nation state or country selling a piece of land to freedom seekers in his book How to Start Your Own Country, 1979. First off, he says, One approach to avoiding the need for a military establishment is buying the territory in question from the nation that currently has it. But this is basically a secondary matter, meaningless until the military situation has been provided for. If the country lacks the willingness or ability to defend the purchased territory by force of arms, the selling country will have a strong incentive to repudiate the sale as soon as the purchaser's check clears. In any case, without being backed up by a force of arms, any bill of sale or title deed held by the new country would be a worthless scrap of paper. Pages 11 and 12. Emphasis added. And it makes perfect sense. This strategy essentially puts the faith in the state to actually uphold their contractual agreement and to not do what they do best, use initiatory force. Consider a hypothetical, non-libertarian drug dealer. If he can run away with the money and the drugs, why wouldn't he? Although, let's take a step back. Why would a nation-state or country even consider selling a portion of their land to freedom seekers? Chances are, they won't. Strauss continues. The closest thing to a sale of sovereignty that is conducted routinely is the sale of corporation charters and ship registrations to all comers, with minimum strings attached. 
by tax haven countries. But any number of those can be sold without reducing the size of the country doing the selling. Once the country is sold, there's no further income to be had. In other words, a country or nation has no financial incentive to actually sell a piece of their land when they can ensure continued payments via the aforementioned methods and even taxation while still retaining sovereignty. I suppose if a country or nation was in such dire straits financially, maybe they would. But that first excerpt from Strauss comes into play. Why wouldn't they just send their military to retake it after the fact? Strauss provides another interesting reason why countries are de-incentivized from selling pieces of the land to country builders. There's also the great power influence. They have networks of grants and aid, favorable trade terms, military assistance programs, etc. to make it worth any small country's while to accommodate one or more of them. While these great powers want to see the status quo maintained, especially they want to see the number of countries held down because the fewer the players there are the easier it is for the great powers to manage things to their own advantage pages 12 and 13 so small countries are even further dissuaded from selling off a portion of their land since they could face potentially deadly ramifications from the great powers and the 100 million dollars vair and the free society foundation have to work with is likely a drop in the bucket considering how much stolen aid the great powers can provide also consider the fact that there would be no vice crimes in ancapistan libertopia or whatever the hypothetical free society would be called If it touched borders with an existing country or a nation state, you can guarantee there would be black marketeers running drugs, weapons and other contraband into the abutting country. Author's update. In his presentation he says, and I'm paraphrasing, that there will be no smuggling of drugs or weapons into other countries for obvious reasons. The established country with tyrannical laws on the books would not be pleased with the prospect and it would definitely be something they would take into account when deciding whether or not to sell land to country builders. So, now that Strauss has probably put a damper on your day with reality, what solutions does he offer to make this solution more likely to be a success? Well, to paraphrase Strauss, a significant enough military force would be required to head it off, the threat, neutralize it, defeat it, turn it away, or otherwise ensure that the great powers intervention won't do them in. Keep in mind that attacks from small countries aren't all the new country founders will have to concern themselves with. It's also the great powers that are always looking to advance their interests. To defend against that seems impossible. No new country would initially have the money or men to build up a military to turn away the massively funded nation state armies, and no private security firm would be stupid enough nor would they have the resources or manpower to agree to such a job. Strauss proposes the solution. Now, however, the new factor is entering the equation, cheap weapons of mass destruction. Even with these weapons, a small unit cannot expect to win an outright war with the large one. However, it can threaten to inflict serious damage on the large unit in the process. By promising to inflict grievous injury in the process of being crushed, they can give the larger units incentive to make detours around the smaller ones to pursue their great power interests elsewhere. As an anarchist, pondering that causes extreme uneasiness, but Strauss is simply laying out the reality of the situation. Author's update. In his presentation, Rogers states that one of the limitations to this new free country will be no nuclear weapons. To paraphrase, he stated that nukes are a violation of the non-aggression principle because they can't be used for any defensive purpose and it's a threat to a lot of innocent individuals. He continues, "Now, some new country organizers will recoil at the thought of inflicting large numbers of casualties, but the fact is that war and the inflicting of such numbers of casualties lies at the heart of statecraft, and he who has no stomach for it needs to look for another line of work." The only way that a nation can avoid having to inflict such casualties is to convince all that it is ready and willing to inflict them. So, the recommendation is that the new country organizers first take steps to make or acquire weapons of mass destruction. If they don't, the chances of the libertarian free society surviving or even coming into existence are slim to none. 
It goes without saying that if any new country projects decide to go this route, it must be done with the utmost secrecy. Remember when Iraq was merely accused of having weapons of mass destruction? Keep it a secret. Nonetheless, I wish Vare and the Free Society Foundation the best of luck. One of the major hurdles is funding. It appears they're off to a swell start there. Though, I sincerely hope the capital investment put into this project doesn't end up expropriated by the state. But we'll just have to wait and see. In summation, I truly am happy to see the focus moving away from political crusading into direct action-oriented strategies, even if they are unlikely to ever come into fruition. But that's not grounds for pessimism. After continued falters, I do believe that individuals will decide to take steps themselves to increase their personal freedom, whether that takes the form of van nomadism, intentional communities, minimalist sailboating, perpetual traveling, or whatever. The outlook for personal freedom has never looked better. Honestly, there is nothing I would love to see more than a functional, stable, new, floating libertarian country out in the international water somewhere. I would be one of the first settlers, although in my estimation, we are still quite far away. Reason being, the current model of nation-states is in no way conducive to this strategy. It will probably take the collapse of the concept, well, or at least just the collapse of America and the EU as a whole, but even then, it sort of depends on what comes next. Although on a smaller scale, I do think we may see some seasteads in the near future. Early on, they would be small. At most, maybe a dozen early entrepreneurs, self-liberators, or founders of the project in question. Import-export would still be necessary, as it would take some time for an alternative economy to develop. How long, you ask? How the hell am I supposed to know? A better question to ask is, how many libertarians, anarchists, or other folk would be willing and able to uproot their entire lives in an attempt to live on the open ocean. That's the problem similar projects of the past faced, and it's one that we will have to deal with going into the future. There is one other strategy whose future is even more distant than the ones we've already covered, and it's the setting and plot device for many of the best anarchist libertarian novels. Of course, I'm referring to space study. As I said above, if any of the aforementioned strategies were to be successfully implemented, a free society might actually exist in physical space and time. Well, if and when space studying comes into fruition, governments become irrelevant. Consider the opportunity cost of chasing tax-delinquent spacecraft nomads throughout the universe. Also, consider the time, money, and effort it would take for governments to locate and subsequently shut down stationary free societies in the vastness of space. Sure, these may not be the most likely possibilities, but they're fun to think about.